Season's a great time, um, and that, that did work really well with uh, the sermon and everything else, actually, the, that video. Um, it was a great time to, to look at that story that on its surface is so simple, but because it was God, you know, speaking and moving in history and bringing things to fulfillment, uh, there's so much else wrapped up in it. And so the first week, like I said, we focused on prophecy, and it was foretold that there would be a Messiah, there would be an Emmanuel, God with us. Um, and, and prophecy is simply God's voice breaking through the silence. You know, he'd fallen silent for 400 years and bringing a message to his people about the relationship and where they were at and then bringing a message about the way forward. Um, and, and it was. It was validated with a foretelling of events to come. Not only was the birth foretold, but the birthplace was foretold. And, and the video said it, and I'll say it, Micah 5.2. It says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler of Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And, and Bethlehem itself is kind of an interesting place. It, it literally means house of bread. That's what the word Bethlehem means. Beth, house, lechem, bread. Um, and Luke chapter 2 tells us about how this came to be fulfilled. That Jesus would be born in this little town. That he would fulfill this prophecy. Um, so Luke 2, 1, 3, and 4 says this. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world would be registered. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So when the time came... When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, when he fulfilled this prophecy, um, several things had to happen. He very easily could have been born in Nazareth. That was truly, you know, the hometown, the place where he would have grown up, etc. But instead, he ended up in Bethlehem because of this census. And so each person had to go to their own town to be basically counted so that um, so they would know how many people there were. And that's how he arrived in Bethlehem. And there's meaning to the fact that Jesus was born in a place called the House of Bread. Uh, a few of the facts, and, and the video mentioned a couple of them. It's five miles south of Jerusalem. Um, it was actually formed uh, by Salma. This is the father of, father of Caleb. And you know, Caleb, as you know, is the, the Israelites are coming to the land of, of Canaan. Um, they, they've just left Egypt. They arrive and they send spies into the land and they come back saying there's giants there. You know, the land's beautiful, filled with milk and honey, but there's giants. We're like grasshoppers at their feet. And Caleb's the one who's like, yeah, but God told us it's ours. Let's go get it. He's, he's the one who, who uh, encouraged people to step out in faith. So it's his father then who founds uh, this town of Bethlehem. And then David, the greatest king of Israel, is born, um, born in Bethlehem. And as a result, then, Rachel, it's her resting place. Uh, but it, it lost prominence after David's time. It became a much less prominent city, even with the trade and everything that went through there. But it was always known for its breads, for baking and, and those sorts of things. And that, that's what got its name. Um, and, and I think there's partly a reason for that. You know, the idea of bread, it evokes a few things for us. You, you know, bread sustains us. I mean, unless you're, what do they call it, paleo? Um, you know, for most of human history, grains and breads, they're sustenance for us. They're, they're provided. and it, um, That's our provision for us. And, and it evokes a few things, too. It, you know, it evokes the idea of warmth, you know, the idea of a hearth, the idea of an oven. Uh, it kind of evokes the ideas of home and of community. You know, you sit down and, and you break bread together. As a matter of fact, we, we break bread together in a symbolic sense each, each Sunday here. But, you know, when you do it at home, whether it be Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner, you know, it, all of that is evoked in the idea of, of the house of bread. But Jesus had more to say about bread throughout his ministry. He, he had a lot to say about it, in fact. Um, and again, he evokes some things by doing it. As a matter of fact, he provokes um, when he starts talking about bread during his ministry. Um, we recently talked about the, the instance where he's, he's on the edge of the Sea of Galilee and people have come to see him because he's been performing miracles and they arrive and it's late in the day and he, he tells the disciples, well, what are we going to do? Um, we need to feed these people. You know, he, he knew, just like I know, people on empty stomachs don't hear <laughs> so Andrew brings this little boy with five loaves and two fish and at the end of the day they're able to gather together 12 baskets and so this is a context right so already we've got bread is in the mix of this story 
Uh, but afterwards, Jesus um, and the disciples, they head out across the Sea of Galilee. They head to the other side. And Jesus sends them on ahead. When they arrive, well, there's Jesus. He's, he's already arrived over there. Um, and we'll pick up the passage in, in John 6, 25. Uh, uh, let's see here. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. So here's Jesus now bringing the commentary back around to, to bread. He says, you know, you, you came, I know you came the first time because of the signs you saw, but now you're coming just so I can fill your belly. You know, um, now you're coming just so I can provide, you know, bread, something that, that, that you desire, something that nourishes you. Um, but he says, you're working so hard for this. You're working for something temporary. Why don't you work for something that leads towards eternal life? And, and so the Jews respond. Um, verse 30, it picks up and says, so they asked him, well, what sign will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So here they are asking for a sign again, just like they did when they showed up um, on the side of the Sea of Galilee. And, and as usual, Jesus has a response, and it's a, it's a provocative response. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So he makes one of his famous I am statements. You know, one of those things that when they hear it, they hear just like when God responded to Moses and said, when, they, when the elders of Israel ask who, who gave this message, God says, tell them I am. And he says, I am the bread of life. And he says several things about it. He says uh, from the Father, he tells them that he's offering a spiritual, something that, that will feed their spiritual hunger and thirst. Not just their physical hunger and thirst. Not just the, the, the passing things that they're concerned about. But something spiritual. And in the midst of this, he's giving them assurances of this calling to eternity and salvation. But did they receive it the way they should? <laughs> Well, that story goes on, 641, uh, says, So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Kind of reminds you of that saying that you find elsewhere in Scripture, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. Um, and, and Jesus finds that to be true. But, but Jesus evokes this idea of bread throughout his ministry. Um, there are other, other things that we'll mention maybe later, but uh, at this point he's talking about, they, they've talked about the manna that God provided from heaven, you know. Uh, when they were wandering in the wilderness, God provided them bread from heaven. And Jesus says, now you know what, I'm the true manna. Uh, 647, it says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So it's figurative. He's evoking the manna already in his talk about himself. Uh, and we see some similarities here. There's no accident in this. Uh, we see some similarities. They started to grumble about Jesus and what he was saying. When they received the manna in Moses' day, there was grumbling. If you recall in uh, Exodus 16, they'd been in the wilderness for a while, and every morning, you know, the dew would gather on the grass, and it would harden into this, this fine crust-like wafer, the manna, and they got tired of eating the same thing every day. And so they grumbled about it. And what God did then was, he said, well, that's not good enough for you. I'll give you some quail. <laughs> It didn't end very well for them. We're not going to dwell there on that. But there was grumbling in Moses' day when God was providing for them in the wilderness. And here we have Jesus coming to, at a time when there's great spiritual hunger and he's offering them the bread of life, you know, the manna in this spiritual wilderness, and there's grumbling. And you know what? We're offered bread now. God's in our midst here and now. He poured out his Holy Spirit upon us. Sometimes we grumble, don't we? People don't change a whole lot. 
You know, when you're out in the wilderness, when things are rough, we, we want it to be that pie in the sky when you die kind of thing. It all be roses and, 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 and wonderful the moment you become a Christian. But that's not the way it happens. That's never been the way it happens for God's people. And sometimes we grumble about it. But everything that was offered then is still offered now. You know, he still offers to sustain you. He still offers what you need in the middle of everything else. Uh, you know, even when the road's kind of hard and unpleasant. Even when you're called to do his ministry, which was hard and unpleasant. Um, God offers us what sustains us. So there's the, the similarities between what happened in Moses' day, what was going on in Jesus' day. But there are other comparisons that are evoked too. Um, Exodus 16.21 tells us about the manna. It says, Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. So the bread that was offered in, in Moses' day was temporary. It wasn't just a little bit temporary. It was day-to-day -day temporary. It melted away. And if they tried to save it and keep it, what happened was, you know, you'd get maggots and it would mold and become nasty. But here Jesus comes as the bread from heaven. And it's eternal. That same passage we started out with, Micah 5, 2. Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Micah was foretelling the fact that the bread of heaven, that Jesus himself, was eternal. Saying this is God who is present at creation. This is Jesus who is eternal, who will be raised up, lifted up on a throne, and who will be sitting there in heaven when each of us comes into glory. So God offers us what we need, what sustains us in the middle of the wilderness when things are difficult. But you know what? He offers to sustain us in his presence as well. You know what happened with that bread later on? You know, bread, it's pleasant when, it's, it, when, when you're out in the wilderness and when you're hungry, but it's even better when you're in that home environment, isn't it? It's even better when you can sit down at the table. And God offers that to us. He offers us his presence, his sustenance in his presence. You actually see it in what happens with the manna. Oh, let's see here, Exodus 16.32. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept, and that's just a, a weight of measurement, throughout your generations, so that you may see, see the bread which I have fed you in the wilderness and when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. So that manna of Moses, it was placed in a jar, it was put on the table of the showbread at times. They also um, placed it then in the Ark of the Covenant. And, and that was important. That was the place where God would come to dwell. Uh, Hebrews 9, 1 through 5 tells us a little bit more about it. He says, For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence, and it's called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was the gold urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablet of the covenant. And above it were cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. All of these things we cannot speak of now in detail. But we do know some details. We know some of the things that were there. And we know a little bit about what they represented. You know, one of the things that was placed with the manna in the Ark of the Covenant was Aaron's staff. If you remember that story, what happened was there was they were deciding who would serve in the temple. And Aaron was told to place his staff down. And what happened as a sign was it budded. Uh, and that was a sign that the Levites, that his tribe, would be the ones who were able to come into the presence of God. Think about what that is for us now. We're called to be a priesthood, a holy nation. We're told that's who we are. We're offered the same thing, the ability to come into God's presence here and now. Placed with, with the manna in the Ark of the Covenant were the, tab the tablets of the covenant. The stipulations, the rules that, that were handed down to Moses on the mountain. But really at their essence, what was it? It was a promise that they would be God's people and he would be God in their midst. And that was placed in the Ark of the Covenant. And then you had the cherubim. You know, on each, uh, each corner of the Ark, you had a cherubim and you had the wings arced back over the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was the place where God dwelt. And then within that, all of that, you place the urn holding the manna. And this was God's provision for them out in the wilderness. 
And they had the ability to, to see this all together. And the same thing's true of us. You know, we can meet Jesus in God's presence with his promises coming into his presence just like the Levites did and we can partake of God's provision in that environment where God is very present, where the God, God of grace and mercy sits. Their, exp uh, their expressions and reminders of God's power, of his provision, of his presence, of his promises, all of that is wrapped up. So God not only provides in the wilderness, he provides in his presence as well. He provides wherever we're at. Yeah, it doesn't matter. He basically is all you need. And that is wrapped up in the fact that our Savior came and called himself the bread of life, coming from the house of bread. Whether you're in the wilderness, whether you're in his presence, he provides everything you need. It doesn't matter whether you're home or in difficulty. Manna was God's provision when he freed his people. Jesus is eternal provision for people that are set free. And I think that, asks, that begs some questions, some things that we ought to ask of ourselves. Do we embrace that truth? That Jesus is our provision. He's our, he's our bread from heaven in every moment. Not, not always. <laughs> I was thinking about yesterday. You know, I, I thought I was done for the day, and then I get this phone call. I, well, actually, I have a lieutenant colonel come up and tell me about it, and then he gives me a phone number, and I get a phone call there. And in the middle of trying to problem solve, I realize maybe I ought to pray about this first because God's what I need in this moment. Or times throughout this week where it was rough. How about you? Each one of us. It's something we ought to ask ourselves each moment of our life. God's provided what we need. Are we embracing that? Do we look to him for what we need? Or do we grumble? <laughs> when that guy cuts me off in traffic, yes, I grumble. <laughs> Do we grumble when somebody doesn't behave like the mature Christian that we think they ought to? Did Jesus grumble when that happened to him? Or did he provide salvation? Did he provide what they needed? The bread of life came to dwell among us. He promises to be with us. And then we're told that we're his temple. We're told that we are being built up into a building, a dwelling place for God. The fact is, we're told that we're a house of bread. The bread of life came to dwell in the midst of his people. And when he was raised up again, he poured out his Holy Spirit so he could continue to be in the midst of his people. And we are his home, his holy temple. Do we have any bread? It's worth asking when we go to minister to somebody, when we try to do the right things for, for Jesus, for God, are we seeking him out first and letting him provide everything we need? If we haven't before, we can. We can do it tomorrow. We can do it five minutes from now. We can do it a week from now. But he's here among us today. The bread of life has come to dwell among us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the humble circumstances of your birth. We thank you for the town of Bethlehem and for what it means. We thank you, Lord, that it was foretold so that we would recognize the message is too true. We would recognize you as Savior. We would recognize that you truly are the bread of life. We thank you, Lord, that you revealed yourself to us, that we have an account of it in Scripture, and that, Lord, you continue to reveal yourself by the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. And, Lord, we thank you that you provide, that you provide for the most desperate of spiritual needs, it is salvation. That you provide for those momentary needs when we lapse, when we stumble. You provide for forgiveness in the moment. In a simple act of repentance, of, of turning back to you, Lord God, you forgive, and we're once again in fellowship and we are once again representatives of your kingdom. Lord God, we thank you that you provide for the practical things, just as you provided for Israel in the wilderness. When we stumble about in this life and when we struggle with the brokenness of this world, the, the brokenness that must continue while you continue to claim souls for your kingdom, we thank you that you provide, that you grant us healing from 
the slings and arrows of the enemy, that, Lord God, you provide us with opportunities to serve you. Lord God, you provide us with opportunities to accumulate crowns of glory that we can cast before you when the time comes. Lord, we thank you for all of it. Be the bread of life for us here today. Have your way with us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.